Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to a special live bonus episode that I'm doing midweek here. Yep, we're all good on sound and everything. So, hi. Um, this is going to be a little bit interesting because usually I try to take a little bit more, you know, serious approach to things and talk about, you know, academic stuff and uh, try to get, uh, you know, try to make interesting points that might have some relevancy in social science and cults and coercive control and all that. And today, <laughs> we're not doing that. <laughs> um, today, we're going to talk about L. Ron Hubbard's, um, well, <laughs> I guess you'd really classify it as a novella these days. It's not really a short story. It's about a hundred page typed manuscript or document that is uh, not really a film treatment, and it's not at all a screenplay. Apparently, there is a screenplay version of this, but it doesn't exist anywhere on the internet that I could find or download or get my hands on. And of course, we are talking about L. Ron Hubbard's classic, epic story um, called Revolt in the Stars. And the very, very interesting thing about this is that, um, well, before we get into that, actually, before we get into that, I said I would comment on something um, beforehand, um, which we, which you will hear more from me about in the not-too-distant future. Uh, and that was a live interview that was done yesterday by Andrew Gold uh, of a um, online's active Scientologist who reached out to him to talk to him and sort of settle some, you know, false information out there uh, about Scientology. And her name is Katie Lohman. She's a little bit of a celebrity. She's a model, an actress, and uh, and she was she was quite the get for Andrew. I mean, it's not, it is not every day of the week that an online active Scientologist, and she is a low-level Scientologist, she doesn't clear, not OT, doesn't know anything about Xenu except what she admitted to reading to uh, reading about on the internet. Um, and boy, was that an interesting hour. I'm pretty sure a lot of you might have seen it. Uh, if you haven't, I would check, I would recommend checking out the whole talk that Andrew did. I thought he did a decent job, especially for somebody who's really just kind of thrown himself into this world. He doesn't really, you know, uh, he's not steeped in all the Scientology lore and criticism um, that, you know, we are. And so, um, so I thought he did a good job. And in fact, he contacted me just before the interview and we talked a little bit and I gave him some tips on on what to do uh, in the interview, and he, and, he, and he, to his credit, he used them. So, uh, so anyway, that was a very interesting little chat, and um, boy, I mean, I was really. <laughs> Here's here was the thing that I thought because it wasn't you know I and I and I uh, it, it's it's it, when you get an opportunity like that. And you know it's only going to be a limited amount of time. It's going to be a live stream. It's going to be you know on air. You're not in a situation where you're going to stage an intervention with the person, right? So what you can really do or utilize that time best for is to show, to really demonstrate to people what that mindset looks like. And what that and where she is at, by the way, is in that beginning euphoria kind of stage where it's all rainbows and butterflies and it's all awesome. And she hasn't you know, she said she's been involved for many, many years, but she's really not hardly anywhere along on the Scientology bridge. She does it part time. And anyway, I don't want to go into a whole big role here except to acknowledge I did watch it. I did think it was interesting. I did a write up on it. Um, it does not address every single crazy thing she said or every crazy thing that is there to be found. She said some some pretty awful stuff at a couple places, but I commented on uh, in my write up on this, and you'll see this appear uh, probably on Tony's blog uh, before too long. Um, I, um, yeah, she said Scientology doesn't work for everybody. That is what she said. Um, and she's right. Even within the Scientology mindset, they will agree that Scientology 
doesn't work on psychos and it doesn't work on criminals and it doesn't work on people whose nervous systems are disrupted physically or damaged. Um, Hubbard said it won't, won't work on them, right? Dianetics won't run. So, uh, so even within the Scientology world, she was right. But what I found interesting about that line is it seemed to me, and I don't know if this is something she came up with herself or whether this was something that uh, OSA, the Office of Special Affairs, might have suggested to her. I don't think OSA condoned her doing that. So I don't think it was a suggestion from them for that interview. I don't. I don't think that, she, I think she did that all on her own. But... Um, This idea that Scientology doesn't work on everybody, right? And therefore, you know, us critics are therefore, you know, the kind of person that Scientology doesn't work on. Um, But boy, if it works, it really works, she says, right? Oh, it works like gangbusters. And like I said, she's still very much in the whole freshman euphoria of the experience of it. And she thinks Sea Org members are really dedicated and hardcore and she could never be a Sea Org member. And, you know, but she really admires those of us who are, were and all that. And it's all just kind of, kind of silly. You know, you're really not getting any real meat uh, with that. It's really just a lot of potatoes. But it was interesting. It was certainly an interesting um uh, talk and it and it and again it showed just like that live stream I did last week where I broke down that interview that Tony had published. I mean, this was great to follow right on the heels of that because both times you are seeing into the mind of a Scientologist. And you know, in the case of the interview that Tony got, which that high schooler had done, um, which I did an extensive show on last week. Um. You know, here you're seeing a high-level Scientologist talking to somebody who, uh, you know, knows very little about it and explaining it to them and breaking it all down. And there was all kinds of levels of crazy in that. Well, here we see a lower-level Scientologist, right? She's done a bunch of book courses and she's done a purification rundown. But there was no evidence that she was even up to the state of clear, much less OT. She hadn't done any of that. So, um Yeah, so it came up because she said she'd read about it. And I'm going to tell you guys something. Um, I'll say this, and then we can move on with the the main show here. But I'll tell you this, is I was posted as the technical secretary overseeing the route for people going from clear on to the OT levels. I did that for a year or two at AOLA back when I was in the Sea Org in the early 2000s. And that's where I got a lot of experience with taking people's clear status away from them and watching how that whole thing went, but also in gatekeeping the OT levels because I ran the area where people would get on to the OT levels. And that's a, that's a whole series of hoops you have to jump through. You do not just pay your money and go walk into the course room. And I've broken this down before in detail. Um, so she hasn't done any of that. But she exposed herself to the OT material on the internet. Well, when I was around in in the Sea Org and in Scientology, and I believe this would still be the case, that's called out security. And Scientology takes a very dim view on that. She may well have said something that is going to lock her out of ever getting the official OT levels in Scientology by making that admission that she had been looking at it on the internet. At least that's how I understood what she was saying, maybe unless I misunderstood her. Um, And so that's kind of interesting, right? I think she's in for a little bit of a rude awakening when... uh, when they when she gets contacted by Scientology about that interview, because there's zero question that she will be, um, you know what tone they will take, how they will deal with that. I am I'm actually in this day right here and now. I am very curious uh, if they're going to take the heavy handed approach or if they're just going to you know give her a wrist slap. She's a little bit of a celebrity, right? Um, so you know, guess we'll have to see how that plays out. Same with the. Uh, with the woman um, who uh, from last week, the the OT seven who gave that interview, I'm I'm curious as tell as to what's going to end up happening to her because, you know, there's no question in my mind Scientology figured out who she was. Okay, so just checking out some of the comments and stuff here. Um, yeah, COB is a Markabian. That's funny. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about. Um, 
Yeah, I couldn't either. I thought I agree with Dylan, right? He says here, uh, uh, oh, let me switch over here, sorry, to the comments page. Yeah, we should get the comments appearing on there in a moment. But Dylan said, uh, that was the interview of the year. I couldn't believe what was happening. Yeah, I, I, as, you know, I, I found out about that uh, literally minutes before when Andrew contacted me. We had about 15 minutes to go back and forth, 20 minutes. I was about to go live on another person's show, so I didn't even get to catch it live or dive into the comments or, or make any, any comments about that because I was doing other media at the time. Um, anyway, so yeah, good stuff. Um, okay, I hope those, uh, we'll just have to see if those comments load on the screen there on the side. If not, then I'll just switch back to full screen. Um, let's go ahead and start talking about Revolt in the Stars. Um, this is, this, this thing is amazing. Um, and it's a real interesting piece of Scientology history and for a number of reasons. Uh, one, because it shows L. Ron Hubbard's <laughs> delusional mindset that he thought at when the, in when Star Wars was peaking in 1976, 77, when it was released and it and it exploded and it was a blockbuster, you know, people were standing around the, the, the lining up around the block to go see the movie. I remember standing in line as a seven year old to go see it. Right, it was huge and the, and it took Hollywood by storm. It took the world by storm. And L. Ron Hubbard looked at that and went, "Well, hell, I'm a sci fi writer. I know all about this. I can do this." And he was always thinking, especially in the 70s, through music and, and cinema and movies and stuff, that he somehow had some secret sauce that he could, you know, throw out there that would uh, entice millions and get them into Scientology. And this never came to fruition. His music was bad. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> well, we'll get into, let's go ahead and get into this, right? So where, where was Hubbard's mind at and what was he trying to do with this in terms of riding on the coattails of the Star Wars phenomenon and trying to bring Scientology lore into it? Um, well, this is from John Atack. I pulled this from an old interview that he did with Tony Ortega, and I'm just going to read it to you because John explains it beautifully. He says, Hubbard wrote this in 1977 while he was holed up in Sparks, Nevada, hiding after the FBI raided Scientology offices in Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles that July. Star Wars had hit theaters in May, and it must have provoked some kind of reaction in Hubbard to see space opera, his old genre, become the subject of the hottest and most lucrative movie in the land. Was Revolt his attempt to cash in by hastily building a script around material he'd written for OT3 10 years earlier? Hubbard apparently had ambitions of making the movie himself. And after relocating to a ranch in the Palm Springs area, began making small technical training films uh, to develop a crew. This was all internal Scientology filmmaking to demonstrate Scientology principles to auditors in training. Hubbard decided that um, it's an audiovisual world and he needed to bring film to clarify and show and help auditors in Scientology to become better auditors. That was sort of the point of those films and they have since made and remade those films many times over the years. That's the whole point of why Golden Era Studios was created in the first place. And this was all out in the desert in Palm Springs. And his chief cameraman, by the way, was young David Miscavige. So very quickly, it became obvious that this was not the route to a large professional feature film. Hubbard, you know, didn't know what he was doing. He'd been on film sets maybe a couple times back in the 30s or something, and that was about his exposure to it. And so his attempt to put a film crew together and, and make, you know, blockbuster movies was clearly going nowhere. So... Millions were raised in the hope of turning Revolt into a movie through a company called Brilliant Films. Um, and Bent Corden tells us in L. Ron Hubbard, Messiah, or Mad Manor Messiah, that the funding fell through and the company went bankrupt. Fortunately for all of us, John Travolta then made it his mission to bring another Hubbard classic, Battlefield Earth, to the big screen, which he did in the year 2000. 
Um, now, um, so here is this property that L. Ron Hubbard, you know, dashed out. It's a hundred page novella. I'm just going to call it that because it's really not a film treatment and it's not a screenplay. Um, so we will call it a uh, novella. And here's a Hubbard quote, again, pulled from Tony's blog about what Hubbard had to say in trying to sell this. He said, the atmosphere of the film is extensive pageantry. Protest groups would be unlikely to find anything amiss in it as it contains very little sex, no nudity, and while its scenes contain violence, it is not of a kind that has been objected to. The motif is the consequences of oppressing populations and minorities with taxation, identity cards, and all-powerful secret police and indirectly warns against what is happening in the U.S. and world at this time, and by extensive public surveys, matches the tone and interest of contemporary audiences, and accordingly would attain wildfire word of mouth when released. It has built in, it has built in psychological factors to reinforce this. The author is writing a book to parallel it. Uh, Hubbard, Hubbard made promises like that often, um, and you know they did not come to fruition. He was he he said over the years many times that he was writing a book about something, and uh, and it never happened. Um, I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> anyway, here's another quote. Uh, this is from um, Denise Brennan. Now, this is a person who was a lawyer for uh, an organizer for uh, Scientology's legal corporate sort out and uh, kind of reworked everything with the lawyers. I don't know that Denise was a lawyer, but uh, she was working with lawyers and uh, establishing the entire labyrinth of Scientology corporate structures in the 1980s, the reorganization of that. So this is somebody who was in the know. This was somebody who was deeply behind the scenes. And uh, Denise left a, left a comment on Tony's blog about this revolt in the stars, which I thought you guys might find interesting. So I dug this up. I was sent, this is Denise talking, I was sent from the Guardian's office worldwide, and that's the precursor to the Office of Special Affairs, is the Guardian's office. I was sent from Guardian's office worldwide on a mission for Hubbard to take the rights to Revolt in the Stars from a brilliant film company so that it could be given to Myron and Alice Robinson, who Hubbard felt would do better in getting the film made into a multi-million dollar blockbuster. Randy Eaton, or something like that, was running ABFC, and I met with him a few times. He had raised seed money and was trying to use it to raise the big bucks needed to get it made into a movie. At that time, I think about $50 million would have been the budget for a top-of-the-line blockbuster movie. And it was something like that that, that, like that that they wanted to raise. Randy had his idea for the start and end of the movie, which would be wrapped around the script. Basically, someone would be scuba diving and there would be an earthquake, which would expose long ago buried, you know, some 75 million years ago, uh, would, would expose long ago buried video recording of what would be the OT3 Incident 2 story. Okay, and um, for those of you who don't know, OT3 level in Scientology has two incidents. There's an incident one and an incident two. And incident two is the whole Xenu story. Incident one is a much smaller little paragraph of description about how four quadrillion years ago, this universe was entered into by us as spiritual beings. We have been kicking around in the physical universe, according to L. Ron Hubbard, for four quadrillion years years. Okay, so that's just another little bit of sci-fi from Hubbard. So, um, okay, so this was going to be covered in Hubbard's script. The scuba diver somehow decided to bring it to the U.S. government who secretly played it. As luck would have it, government movie players of the late 20th century could in fact play movies made 75 million years ago. I am not kidding here. Then you would see Hubbard's story from way back then. 
After the story from Hubbard played, you would see the U.S. government reps decide to hide the film so that it would never be seen by the public. The implication being that some 75 million years later, somehow the U.S. government was carrying on the plot started by Xenu and his buddies. So in effect, Xenu was still somehow running this from behind his electronic mountain trap. Nothing's too crazy for Hubbard world. Little did Randy Eaton know... But we were working on a plan to take the movie from him as Hubbard was impatient and wanted the movie made now. I even met secretly with a Hubbard messenger in a hotel room then. I will not name her as I don't believe she's speaking out yet. She briefed us on what Hubbard wanted. We met with Myron and Alice Robinson who were ready to take over the movie. I have no idea who was crazier in this little cast of characters, but I do know that they had zero chance of getting a big studio to take it up. One big reason was, check this out. One big reason was that Hubbard had injunctive relief rights in his agreement, which meant that he had to approve of every detail of the movie or he could get its production stopped. Wanted absolute control of that. Hubbard said that he had to, had to ensure that it was true to what really happened 75 million years ago, and only he could tell if it was. So the studio might spend $50 million to make a blockbuster only to have Hubbard say it had to be reshot because the clothes the studio had people wearing 75 million years ago on Earth were not what they really wore. Hubbard said he would go into session as the filming progressed and then pass on details of the clothes worn on Earth, then the cars driven, etc., etc. No kidding, Tony. Could you, this is again, Denise talking. No kidding, Tony. Could you imagine any credible studio ever agreeing to shoot, reshoot, and reshoot every single time Hubbard would review a scene only to say they got something wrong? The story of Revolt in the Stars is far wackier than even what you and John write about. Those were the days. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so, um, yeah, pretty wild stuff. Hey, New Zealand, uh, just uh, poking in here on the comments. Yeah, good stuff. So, um, okay, so I made... Okay, now, first off, I got I to gotta, uh, say... Um, you guys should very much appreciate... <laughs> <laughs> I have spent the last two days both on that live interview and write and doing a write up on that and this thing. Uh, and my eyes have been ready to fall out a couple times. This is a hundred pages, a hundred and five pages of some of the most cataclysmically awful writing I have ever. It's, I, you know, I've seen it before and I kind of forgot how bad it was. If you thought Battlefield Earth as a movie was bad, it's got nothing on how bad this thing is. I have seen second graders write better material than what L. Ron Hubbard put together in this script. It is horrifyingly awful, laughingly bad. Like I couldn't, the hardest part about getting through it was actually that I had to keep taking breaks because I had to, I couldn't stop laughing at how bad it was. I mean, we're talking about, this is a guy, here's the thing that's amazing about this is L. Ron Hubbard made his living writing Pulp Fiction for decades. That was his job. He, He wrote story after story after story after story. And, you know, a lot of those stories really suck, but this one has to be the worst crap I have ever read any professional author write. It's horrifying. Um, And I will say that I am biased, of course, because of, you know, my whole anti-Scientology thing, but I'm also biased because my wife has a master's degree in screenwriting. She's a professional screenwriter. I mean, that's what she knows how to do. She's, she hasn't, I shouldn't say professional because she hasn't been paid for it, but she's very educated in it. And she and I have talked at length about story structure and the, you know, the hero's journey and all the ways you write and all the things you don't do when you write. And Hubbard breaks 
every rule in the book thinking he's, you know, some high echelon, top speed, you know, amazing writer. And he is, anyway, it's it's really bad. Now, to get into some specifics about that before we get into the story and stuff, um, the characters are just, the characters in this story, every single one of them are tropes, stereotypes, and caricatures. They are not real people. They're not even trying to be. Hubbard doesn't, Hubbard wouldn't know how to write a real person if, well, you know, if it came up and slapped him. Um, they're identified by stereotypical dress and mannerisms with no thought whatsoever to being fully formed human beings. Um, really, it reads like a cartoon script. It reads like a children's Saturday morning cartoon script, except that there is lurid sexual references and violence in it, um, like like some pretty hardcore violence. Uh, so, yeah, even some stuff that you might even consider sadistic. So, it's it, so it's not really Saturday morning cartoon material, and yet the, the the quality of the writing, the scene shifts, the dialogue, the the story layout, the way it all plays out. It's nonsensical to that degree where people are doing things that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. No person would ever do that. But here they are doing it because Hubbard has a story to tell. And that story has to be the thing that drives everything forward. But remember, the other thing about this story, and I mean this in all seriousness, is that L. Ron Hubbard considered he was writing historical fact. He really thought all this stuff actually happened for real. And I did a little bit, now we'll get into it later, but there's a little bit of um, fact checking I did on this that like I did in my book when I broke down the Xenu story, if you guys don't know, I wrote a whole book breaking down Scientology and it's called Scientology A to Xenu. And there's a whole chapter in there that I don't think anybody else has ever really done of all the OT levels, all through OT7, and a full breakdown of what's wrong with them. And I really went into detail about OT3 and why it is impossible for it to be literal truth. It can't be. For reasons that Hubbard could have found out about even back then. It's not like we've all learned since then all this new science stuff. It was impossible on the, in the, you know, the day that Hubbard wrote it. Just factually, scientifically speaking, right? We know this. Um, so I'll give you guys a few a breakdown on some other things I dug up uh, along the way here because there's some very interesting stuff in this script that isn't really to be found anywhere else in Scientology that I've ever seen. For example, uh, as you'll see, he, he names out all of the stars that make up the 13... Star, the star systems that compose the Galactic Confederation. He names them by name using modern, the way, you know, the stars that we know. And uh, anyway, and we'll get into a little bit of fact checking on some of that. Um, you know, nobody called him Lafayette. Uh, okay. And in terms of, um, you know, just one sampling of, of, of how ridiculous this story is, is actually. The, the sort of toss-off names, the, just this off-the-cuff names, these simple, stupid names, these cartoon names for the characters. Um, it's, and, I, and I listed them as I went through the, the manuscript. And uh, we have Jedger, the jut-jawed czar of, of all U.S. police and security forces. Hubbard imagines there's one guy in charge of, of all of the police and security in the United States. And his name is Jedger. And he's got a jet jaw. <laughs> I had to look that up because I had no idea what that meant. It just means pointy. Um, there is the president. There is Jenkins, another scientist. There, And then we get into the old names of the people back in the day. So we have Mish, uh, one of the loyal officers. And the loyal officers are the good guys. The loyal officers are the people that L. Ron Hubbard now imagines are, are making up the Sea Org. He said that. He used to tell Sea Org members that. You guys are the, all the loyal officers from back in the day. You are the good guys. You're the guys who fought back. You're the guys who keep coming back, right? So you have, uh, well, who were these loyal officers? Well, Mish <laughs> was the loyal officer in charge of the Outer Limits. And there is Rawl, 
the Speaker of the Congress and the loyal officer who's in charge of Earth. And it's interesting because in the script, he calls it Earth. He does not refer to it as Tegiak, which is what he says the old name of planet Earth is, is Tegiak. But in, the, in, this, uh, in this story, it's Earth. We have Xenu, of course. We have Chi, who is the Minister of Police of the Galactic Confederation. We have Lady Min, uh, who is some famous actress. Uh, we have Zell, the chief of the secret police of Earth. We have Chu, C-H-U, who is the executive president of the Galactic Interplanetary Bank. And he's described, now this is what I mean by caricatures. Check this out. Here's the description of Chu when he first appears. A fat, pudgy man, very much like a pig, slid forward. His civilian clothes were quite plain, but he wore four diamonds in his tie and a huge diamond on each hand. Then there's App, or Ape, App, A-P, and that's Lady Min's press agent. And there's Dr. Stug, Xenu's private psychiatrist, uh, complete with pointed beard and ribboned eyeglasses. Even 75 million years ago, they had pointed beards and uh, ribboned eyeglasses. There is Zell, the head of the Earth Secret Police. Uh, there is Sty, Sty, S-T-Y. This is a guy's name. He's the chief psychiatrist for Earth. And then there's Sna, <laughs> S-N-A. He's a gun runner. There's Dr. Axe. And there is Pilot Tring. And those were the named characters in the story. All of them. They're, they're, every one is just completely ludicrously named. Um, and I thought you might, got, you know, I was wearing my uh, Xenu is my co-pilot shirt today. If you guys see this, you can, you can buy this in my merch store. Um, Xenu's entrance. I thought you might appreciate it. It's, it's actually not this. This is, this is something I got. Uh, I just, I just uh, cribbed this from a Lego uh, alien figure, right? Because I thought it was, uh, I thought it was kind of clever, and it had some braid and this and a and a cape and stuff. But here is the actual description of Xenu, in case any of y'all were wondering, what did this dude look like? You know, he's presented as this sort of alien figure or this kind of uh, Cthulhu-looking figure, I think, in the South Park. Um, or we have this other kind of bearded man, bald guy kind of figure. But here's how he's actually described. Yeah, here we go, Anthony. <laughs> Xenu, bitter-faced, sardonic, leaning heavily on a cane that was more like a club, limped forward to the front edge of the draped railing. He glared down at the stalled group on the concourse below and did not like what he saw. The dark somberness of his civilian suit, the darkness of his hair and face seemed to spread outward. The cheering below dimmed off to silence. The band faltered and died down. So apparently Xenu appears and all this celebratory stuff that's happening, uh, welcoming this Congress that's about to start. Xenu shows up and everybody goes quiet and, and kind of hates this guy. And he's the supreme leader and apparently was elected to office. And he's been there for eight or ten years and everybody hates him. Okay. Okay. Sure, Ron. Um, <laughs> then there is... Um, okay, then later on, Xenu appears in council chambers and he's wearing a black robe. So goes from somber civilian suit to a black robe, and that's that's pretty much uh, from what I saw the physical descriptions of Xenu in the story. Um, now Chi, on the other hand, C H I, uh, who is um, this secret police guy, he is jut jawed, bulldog faced, squat, and as crudely built as his civilian suit was rumpled was oblivious by any announcement. He stepped up to Xenu's side and looked belligerently down at the stalled groups on the concourse. That's Hubbard's writing. All throughout this, that's the quality of Hubbard's writing. Looked belligerently down at the stalled groups on the concourse. I, you know, you're just like, okay, cool. Um, okay, so to summarize, we're, you know, rather than kind of walk through this whole thing page by page, 
I highlighted a few things that I thought I might mention or talk about. But first, let's go ahead and take a look at the... Um, <laughs> um, let's... T- <laughs> so he's Supreme Leader Snoke. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, yeah, Ming the Merciless type. Actually, I couldn't help... But that's a, that's a good comment there, Gnome saying, cause, um, because that's exactly what I kept thinking while I was reading this, is I kept hearkening back to um, Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers and the, you know, the campy ridiculousness of those stories and the, you know, the hero that's always good and the, and the, the woman who's always loyal and always the damsel in distress, but she's got pluck and she's got spirit, you know, that's, that's Hubbard's way of thinking about heroes and heroines and villains are Ming the Merciless. This Xenu character actually compares more to a cross between Ming the Merciless and a character named Brown Limper Stafford in Battlefield Earth, who is who acts and talks exactly like Xenu. It's the same caricature. It's this bad guy with a limp. He has a cane. He sort of hobbles around. And you never really know where he even got the limp from. But Hubbard's always got to throw some kind of, you know, physical deformity or damage on his villains. There are always these sort of you know, they're physically repugnant and repulsive and, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of asexual and they're not really into things and, and they're just repugnant characters. And that's his idea of the ultimate villain is these, is these laughable, um, comic book characters, right? So here's the plot. Let's just, let's just break this down. And I just pulled this right off of the Wikipedia page. People ask me, by the way, I wanted to say this out loud here, is people ask me because I use Wikipedia all the time, and I use it because it's readily accessible by anybody. Any of you can go and see the source I'm reading from. And that doesn't mean Wikipedia is a great research reference guide. It's the start of where you do your research, not the end. But I use it because it's helpful to uh, give references for you guys that you can find. And I don't want to quote from some, you know, academic papers, you know, buried somewhere in Google Scholar or something. So, uh, so here's the plot in, in essence. Um, the story takes place 75 million years ago before modern times. An evil galactic ruler named Xenu massacres millions of people with assistance from Chu the executive president of the Galactic Interplanetary Bank, and Chi, the Galactic Minister of Police. So Chi and Chu, or Chu and Chi. Xenu's <laughs> uh, psychiatric advisors, Stug and Stai, help him gather unwanted beings from all of the planets in his control and transport them to Earth. And it's interesting because it's not everybody. It's not all the teeming billions of people who get massacred. It's select people. And during the course of the story, he kind of says who they're targeting. Um, The beans are stacked around the bases of Earth's volcanoes, including Loa, Mount Vesuvius, Mount Shasta, Mount Fuji, Mount Etna, and others. And he names them. And exterminated by detonated planted charges of atomic bombs. Uh, In the story, Hubbard wrote, great winds raced simultaneously across the face of Earth, spreading tales of destruction. Xenu's massacre of these beings is called Phase 3. It's a whole operation on the order of of, uh, Lucas's Order 66, actually. It's, It's very, very interestingly parallel to that. Uh, the, the whole operation rolls out in three phases, and the first phase is to take out all the loyal officers. That's the sort of Order 66 uh, way that it starts. That's a Star Wars reference, if you go, um, for those of you who don't, don't follow Star Wars like I do. <laughs> okay, so a character named Mish is one of the only loyal officers who survives Xenu's organized massacre, and other characters include Lady Min and a hero figure, and that hero is named Rawl, R-A-W-L. And what the hell you would name some hero Rawl? I, I, I don't. I can't even. So, um, okay. And we will talk maybe later about the. Um, 
what are you left out of this? Because this is because here's the thing about this story is well, maybe I'll just talk about it now. Um, the OT3 narrative in Scientology, the most important part of it, and the thing that really matters to Scientologists is not this. It's not this story. It's the body thetans and the fact that this mass genocide here on Earth was such a traumatic episode for every single soul who was here, every thetan who was here, that they were devastated, overwhelmed as beings and went into a kind of stupor and unconscious state and clustered together. And that's where body thetans come from. And that's not in this story. None of that's in this story. The implanting, the forced uh, three, I think it was three weeks is what he says in the, in the uh, Scientology materials of implanting where all of these disembodied souls that had just been blasted by atomic bombs were now gathered up through a, with electronic force fields and, and tractor beams and forced to sit and endure weeks or months of implanting where they were implanted into thinking that sex was important, that religion is a thing, angels, devils, and all that. Um, apparently, Zenu had this whole master plan where he wasn't just going to kill them. He was going to implant them and make them think that they had to have short lifespans in the bodies that they occupied and that, that, uh, that they had to have sex and that they had to have religion and all the modern tropes of religion and sex were entered into our collective consciousness, our thetans, right, our, our, our memories, um, during that time. And that's the important part. That's all the stuff that matters because all those body thetans, those disembodied souls who were all stuck together, glommed on to the survivors, the thetans who didn't get overwhelmed by it or didn't succumb to it. But they were all stuck here on this dead planet and life had to evolve again because it had just been atomically exploded into nothing. And so that's where we get you know, modern life growing and, and, and evolving here and thetans prowling around, hanging around, doing whatever with their body thetans. And then as bodies appear, they start occupying them again. And this is all just what you can kind of put together between the, 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 the facts that Hubbard's dropping. Like it kind of has to be this way because there's no other way that makes sense that this whole thing could have happened here 75 million years ago, which, by the way, was in the middle of the Cretaceous period. I looked it up. Uh, we had dinosaurs. We had grass growing newly. We had all kinds of things happening on planet Earth. But none of this happened. Um, but that's what Hubbard says, right, is that's when it happened, is during that 75 million years ago is when he dates it to. But we now know through um, archaeology and geology and earth science and all of that that uh, that that was actually the Cretaceous period, and we have a pretty good idea of what planet Earth looked like. And we also know specifically about these volcanoes and stars and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, I just want to differentiate what this is versus what the Scientology materials are, because that's kind of an important omission in the story, right? He didn't put any of that in there. And he didn't put any of that in there because that's the truly damaging, harmful, awful stuff. That's the stuff that's supposed to cause you to, you know, if you start trying to run it and look at it and think about it and, oh, was I there and what happened? That's what's supposed to cause you to what's called sort of spin in, right, or, or uncontrollably kind of run this stuff and end up consuming you and causing you to uh, get pneumonia or have accidents and end up killing you right? That's part of the whole implanting is you're not supposed to remember any of it at all. And if you do, there's all these mental landmines in place to kill you so that you'll forget again and have to go get another body and then you won't remember anything all over again. And here we go around and round and round the, you know, the Ferris wheel we go. So that's, that's, you know, again, kind of an important distinction. And yes, Hubbard actually believed this. Yes, he did. Um, just to answer Cynthia's uh, question there, since I see that, um, you know, this is, yes, 
Absolutely. Hubbard thought this was absolutely true. And yet at the same time, did he? Right? It's it's more, it, the real answer is more like some days he did. <laughs> there were some times when he did. And there were other times when it might be quite apparent that he did not. And he absolutely knew he was getting one over on people. But by the 70s, by the time he was writing this stuff, his mind was very, very gone. Uh, he was way off in believing all the conspiracy theories and delusions that he had created over the last 20 years. And he kind of steeped himself in an awful lot of conspiracy theory and paranoia, even to the point where they were, you know, in-house targeting people and getting rid of people and having purges and all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Hubbard was very paranoid. And so that kind of bleeds into all of this too. When I have to answer a question like that, I go, well, it's a little complicated whether he did or didn't believe it. It's more like maybe on Tuesday and Thursday he did. And on Friday and Saturday, he didn't, wasn't really thinking about it because he was too busy looking for I, you know, FBI and IRS uh, agents infiltrating Scientology and stuff like that. He was just full on crazy mode by the mid to late 1970s. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, this is pretty nutty stuff, right? But this whole story, in t as told in detail here, is the is the detailed account of what Hubbard only sort of hints at in the Scientology materials. He doesn't really go into this level of detail anywhere in Scientology, which is why Scientologists would be like, oh, wow, but only OT, see? If you're not OT3, nobody's ever going to show you this or even tell you about it. I didn't know anything about this. I had heard that there was some screenplay somewhere, but nobody ever let me see it or, or read it. So, uh, so imagine my surprise right, when I find this stuff later. Um, okay, so we've got some examples here I've already highlighted and told you guys about with um, just, this, just this horrible writing right from the get-go. There's a little prologue or intro here. Um, yeah, like here's, okay, like just to give you guys a little flavor of this, okay? Okay. Um, because, you know, I'm just kind of going on at a mad rate. But like, OK, so here's the prologue where the president of the United States and this guy, uh, Jengar, the, the, the head of all the police, um, are deciding what to do with this capsule, the sphere that was found in the ocean that they don't know what it is or what it's about. Um, and uh, and so the guy who discovered it, this kid who discovered it, is like, hey, man, I, you know, I think I have some rights to discovery here. And um, and Jedgar comes up to him and here's here's what he says. You give me any more crap, Jedgar yanked the young man close to him, and you'll be charged with conspiracy to steal archaeological treasures. Section 896, three years in jail. Not one more word out of you. Not to the public, not to your friends, not to the press. He hurled the young man from him violently so that he staggered and fell. This, pronounced Jedgar, is a state matter. The young man looked up from the ground, defeated. He looked out to where a government scuba diver was guiding in the cables. There was no sympathy there. He looked at the tense marine backs, because there's these marines standing around with guns, right? He looked at the scientists. He looked at Jedgar. He was totally, completely, and utterly ignored. He had never felt more lonely. He got up and unsteadily wandered across the sand, head down, shuffling. He went out through the cordon and wandered away through the distant crowd. And this is, uh, can you imagine now <laughs> trying to get away with some shit like that? Uh, you know, I think everybody uses phones would be out. Anyway, it's, it's all rather silly. But then, just a couple paragraphs later. All right, yelled Jedgar. Let's get the thing loaded on a plane. Maybe he could still get to the racetrack. See, this guy Jedgar, in charge of all the, the police, can't stop thinking about debts that he has with his bookie. And, uh, and then we get this description of Washington, D.C., right, from Hubbard. And, and, you know, one of the things that I really hate about modern entertainment is the way it just sort of slaps you around with messages, right, with its messaging. Especially, anyway, there's a lot of very heavy-handed messaging going on. 
modern messaging and modern uh, cinema ain't got nothing on Hubbard. He is, it's rife throughout this thing. He is preaching, preaching, preaching. And, um, and here's what he writes as for an example. Um, so they're going to get this thing loaded on a plane and send it off to uh, Washington, right? Washington the fair, Washington the beautiful, home of the incorruptible politician and the shining knights of social justice, basked in the summer sun, owned, operated, and controlled, as usual, by the bankers and their police. The Institute, capital I, the Institute sat on a low hill, securely backed by the printing plant that poured the newly printed money into the hands of the deserving few. As much summer sun as could get through the smog entered the windows of a large hall and fell upon the object. Now, that was supposed to be a transition. (laughs) There's no transitions in this thing. It is one paragraph is on the beach and literally the next paragraph is somewhere else. And it's and you kind of have to guess, oh, we're having a transition here. We're going from one place to another. This is throughout the script. This goes on or the the story. So it's not even well written that way because it's not clear at all where you're going or where you are from one moment to the next. I thought that was weird. Um. And it's and anyway, and it's also it's also kindergarten in simplicity. This is this is uh, this is what I love about conspiracy theorists and conspiracy theories is this is the sort of uh, kindergarten level thinking that goes on with it, right? Everything is so simple. There is one guy who heads up all the police, and if we just handled that guy, everything would be wonderful. You know, it's this kind of thinking. If we just deal with this one thing and leave everybody alone. Everything would be great. Uh, it's not how it works. Um, oh, yeah. And here we get other things, right? Hubbard's, okay. So carbon dating is something Hubbard railed about all the time in his lectures. He talked about this and how and what a, what a fake it was because uh, science, he said, and I'll never forget this because this stuck with me for years when I was in Scientology, is he said carbon dating is the way that you go about dating any old object, which is not true. It has to be organic matter. And he said very boldly that scientists have completely misdated everything because they don't know accurately how much carbon actually exists in the universe and how long it actually takes to degrade. And so their testing apparatus is totally wrong. And the universe is significantly older, he says, than any scientist on planet Earth believes. So you have to remember or take into account that when you hear Hubbard talk about dates, because he elongates things by orders of magnitude, just just enormously, and says things are much, much, much older than they really are. Thus, he can say in incident one that the universe here is four quadrillion years old. No, it's just orders of magnitude off. It's not quadrillions. It's not trillions. It's, you know, it's, it's in the billions. That's how old the universe is. And um, anyway, so he demonstrates this kind of scientific ignorance right in the story. Here they are with this metal, big eight-foot tall sphere how old is it where does it come from well the instrument technician pulled a wad of tape out of the notes and with some difficulty stretched it out this is stretching our equipment but i'd say that according to the carbon age test this thing is tens of millions of years old close to 75 million years old at an estimate Doesn't even know how to date stuff. Um, Talks about radiation. Anyway, we definitely get a lot of Hubbard ignorance bleeding over into this. Let's see what else I highlighted as I go through this. So they they get this thing and they open it up and and this and this uh, sort of pre recording rolls into place and it's like, oh, you guys don't know the true history of your planet, but you're about to find out. 
and the president of the United States gets a sort of one man uh, audience uh, presentation of this entire story. That's the, how the whole thing begins. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the president, suddenly mindful of his traditional White House responsibilities, rose to the crisis. Clear the room. This may contain confidential information. It can talk. It's the quote from the president. It can talk. I mean, it, it, it's like, it's like they're just, it's like a kid is writing this. Um, okay, now I went through and I was highlighting, uh, my intention in going through it uh, was to kind of highlight certain sections to talk about, like some of the pure Scientologies that's in here. Now, the whole thing is pure Scientology, so I kind of realized afterwards, well, maybe that's not the best way to describe it, but, but here is where maybe I could say, here is where he gives a little bit more detail about the OT3 stuff, like specifically, right? Um, so here is the beginning of this recording, and this is Mish, a loyal officer of the people of the Galactic Confederation, and somehow this is all being translated into English by the technology they have. Um, you know, they don't have, uh, anyway, yeah. He stretched his hand behind him to the wall. I'm just going to read to you from this, okay? There's a star map there. A star map glittered and sparkled. You may never have heard of the Galactic Confederation. It consisted of 21 stars and their 76 inhabited planets. You were one of those planets. Earth was a beautiful jewel then. It had vast cities, lovely forests and mountains and billions of inhabitants. You know, I just can't help myself. Let me let me go do this real fast just to um, let me see if I can pull this up real fast and find this for you because I just can't. Okay, the Cretaceous. The Cretaceous is a geological period that lasted from 145 to 66 million years ago. This is the time period Hubbard is talking about. It is the third and vinyl period of the Mesozoic era um, longest of the geographical periods. Okay, the Cretaceous period was a period with a relatively warm climate resulting in high sea levels that created numerous shallow inland seas. These oceans and seas were populated with now extinct marine reptiles and uh, dinosaurs continued to dominate on land. Dinosaurs. There's no dinosaurs in this story. Um, the world was ice-free, and forests extended to the poles. Yeah, no ice. During this time, new groups of mammals and birds appeared. During the early Cretaceous, flowering plants appeared and began to rapidly diversify, becoming the dominant group of plants across the earth by the end of the Cretaceous, coincident with the decline um, oh, of some other stuff. I don't want, I'm trying not to use big words here. Um, the Cretaceous ended with a large mass extinction in which many groups, including non-avian dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and large marine reptiles died out. Um, yeah. And, of course, Scientologists would tell you, well, yeah, because that was when all the atomic bombs went off. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Hubbard describes the Earth as and it wasn't anything like that billions of inhabitants uh-huh okay but all was not calm things had happened not just on earth but all over the confederation he propped up a screen on his desk a mob appeared on it an angry mob carrying placards surging and seething outside a building Mish continued, throughout the galaxy, symptoms of unrest hitherto unknown in the Confederation were occurring, as you can see by these news clips. I'm fascinated by the fact that they had news and yet there was never any conflict <laughs> until Xenu came along. <laughs> okay, Ron. 
Um, an old woman was being mugged on the street. She fell. One of the muggers snatched her purse. The other kicked her in the face. Crime was becoming commonplace. A littered street lined with broken shop windows appeared. Where there was a power failure in a major city, thousands of people began a fury of looting and burning. A schoolyard appeared. A young girl was being attacked by a mob of thugs. All these conditions had begun in the past eight years. So the Galactic Confederation exists for thousands of years. And then Xenu comes along and in Eight short years, everything goes to hell. Peaceful, pacifistic societies that really never had to deal with much of anything. They talk about a gray invasion where some gray people somehow came in and the loyal officers threw off that invasion and repelled those invaders and and destroyed them. And that's the extent of galactic conflict within the Confederation. Uh Uh-huh. A a continuing reading here. A horde of secret police in gray-green uniforms and riot dress were shown charging a mob. The popularity of the government had dropped to an all-time low. A tank was shown attacked by a mob. They turned it over on its side. A government building was shown. The huge sign, Tax Office, was suddenly obscured by a blast of flame. The words idealism and patriotism had become meaningless throughout the 76 planets. A large array of assorted arms and explosives were being displayed by police, a cache discovered in a basement, enough material to fight a regiment. Gun running had become a highly profitable business. Eight years, 76 planets. Uh, Trucks loaded with bales of drugs were being unloaded by police and tumbled into a huge bonfire. Organized crime was profiting as never before. To combat it, hundreds of thousands of secret police were being recruited by the government. The, the, The secret police in Hubbard's world are the least secret thing in existence. Everybody knows who they are. They're, it's their title, the, se- the head of the secret police. Long ranks of men in gray-green uniforms were shown drawn up. A colored agitator speaking from a platform was shown haranguing a mob. A secret policeman lined the speaker up in the sights of a blast rifle and fired. The agitator was smashed backwards. But the government, in its turn, was using more and more force in an attempt to control the violence. A civilian sniper appeared on the parapet of a building. Beyond him, a city spread out. The sniper fired down into the street. And reprisals were earning reprisals in their turn. Mish folded the screen. He looked at his notes and then up again. The Galactic Confederation was very old. It had endured for thousands and thousands of years. It had been happy, prosperous, and peaceful. The planets were politically democratic. The people elected their own governors and civil officials, and the entire galaxy was governed by the Congress of Loyal Officers of the People. These were trained men, skilled in political and martial arts. When they were graduated from their academy, they stood for election to the Congress, and those chosen loyally served the people. There was also an executive branch headed by the Supreme Ruler. A man also elected by the people and responsible for the day-to-day running of the Confederation, but under the laws and appropriations of Congress. Mish laid down his notes. The Congress of the Loyal Officers of the People met every 10 years. Matters of state finances and other concerns had been smooth and routine. Everything was beautiful in this most beautiful and wonderful of worlds. In the 2053rd Congress, indeed, there had been no upsets at all throughout the galaxy. The Gray Invasion had occurred just before that. An invader had attempted a destruction of the Confederation, had sailed in in savage attack, and had been effectively and efficiently destroyed. 
He had come from another galaxy, but he had found the Confederation prepared and alert, and that was the end of him. The gray invasion was shot out of space even before full mobilization could occur on Earth, and our planets and the whole affair had become ancient history. The 2053rd Congress had done what was necessary to handle all that, and it was finished. Thus, it was with considerable concern that the loyal officers came to the 2054th Congress. Revolt was growing in the stars. And it was in this atmosphere that the 2054th Congress met to decide what course to take on home planet many light years away from Earth. The loyal officers of the people were arriving from every part of the galaxy. And that is your setup to being introduced to Xenu and the loyal officers and how it is. Well, let's go into this just a little bit because I highlighted another thing here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, Where Hubbard goes to town. Um, Yeah, here we go. So what is it? Yeah, I know, right? Uh, you guys are awesome for enduring this. Um, let me see how we're doing here, by the way. Yeah, we're okay, good. So, um, okay, now I'm not going to do a whole lot more big reading like that, but I do have a couple other highlights for you. So, um, so let's, here's, here is what they were all so upset about. What was it that in eight short years had caused everything to go to hell in a handbasket? You, you, you're not going to believe this. Well, maybe you will. Every one of the things that Hubbard was guilty of avoiding and evading is what caused all the problems. Rawl glanced at the folder he held. These ideas are, this is, he's now, Rawl the hero is coming and, and confronting Xenu in the Congress in front of everybody. And he's saying, hey man, you've been putting these policies in place and we are not down. And what were the policies? Personal income tax credit records, fingerprinting all citizens, identity cards, and passports. That, according to L. Ron Hubbard, is what ruins civilizations and causes civil unrest and causes people to become so violently agitated that they start shooting and killing each other and killing government officials and police. How dare you give me an ID card? A passport? Are you out of your mind? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what caused all the unrest. And, we're, and there's more, right? He gets into it. Um, Hubbard could not get enough of why these were evil things. And this was, see, this is all, Zenu here is in charge of this Congress, and he's sort of twirling his mustache. <laughs> Ah, yes, the income tax, right? Um, So the committee and the Congress are kind of blowing up here, right? And Rawl is saying, um, you know, Your Excellency, these are the crime records of all 76 planets for the past 10 years. Here also are the complaints and petitions of those planets. Here as well are the financial records and appalling rate of inflation of the galaxy. How is it that Rawl has any records of any crimes if nobody's got, is nobody supposed to have any personal IDs and there's not supposed to be any records of this stuff? I mean, these are obvious, that's an obvious question. How is it that this guy is presenting all of this information to show how bad all of this is when they're not even supposed to have that information? Because how could they? So they put it all in place across 76 planets, <laughs> not cities, not towns, not villages, planets. And they do all of this with such ruthless efficiency that it's all slammed into place, put into action, and then revolted against within eight years. Okay, Ron. Well, uh Personal income tax and credit records carry with them a total invasion of privacy. Identity cards and passports put every citizen at the mercy at the mercy of personal enemies as well as the state. That's one of Rawls' opening arguments as to why this is so bad. Um, 
<laughs> He's got petitions with thousands and thousands of names. Really, Rawl, you collected all these petitions with all these people's identities. <laughs> Rawl continued, even more mild and more persuasive. Quote, such measures are the mechanisms that make slaves of a people that sap their initiative and fill them with fear. His gaze at Xenu leveled. His voice became very firm. These are the mechanisms of tyranny and oppression, and no right-minded citizen would ever permit them. They are the tools of the sly slave master, and every one of these measures is a stench in the nostrils of free men. (laughs) Like I said, you know, this was painful. This is page 18. (laughs) I had to go through 100 pages of this. So I'm sharing my pain. Um. Okay, an abrupt rolling shout of approval burst from the hall. And this is Rawl here, right? Stood very straight. The executive branch is regarding populations as domestic cattle to be milked for taxes and the payment of loans. You are earmarking and branding them with enforced identity cards. You are even teaching them in schools that they are animals. You do not own them. They are not your herd. They are free human beings, not economic slaves or government property. And any government that violates this fact cannot end in anything but destruction of both itself and the people. This is not opinion. This is history. When? (laughs) If they've never had ID cards and income tax and, and credit records, when? When was this history? Anyway, again, we, we shouldn't ask questions too, too sharply of any of this. Okay, and then here comes the justifications coming back from the uh, state police guy and from Xenu. The only way to handle crime, said Zell. This is this guy's name, Zell. Uh, The only way to handle crime is to be able to lay your hands on any citizen at any time. Men are all basically criminal, without identity cards, without the most detailed dossiers. For police blackmail, came a shout from the hall. Uh, The most detailed dossiers, continued Zell, without passports to cut down criminal travel, police work would be utterly impossible. He's right. (laughs) If you do need mechanisms in place to identify and locate criminals, you know, I mean, amongst many, 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 many other reasons why it's not a bad idea to have ID, credit, and uh, credit records and passports. 76 planets, and we're all just supposed to believe that everybody gets along peacefully, everything is wonderful in this most beautiful of all possible worlds. Right? He alludes to a criminal element or underground, but offers no mechanism or, or anything here as to how all of this was kept under control. The police are bad, the government is bad, and the loyal officers are good because no regulation is the way society should be. This is, this is why I talk about Hubbard's sort of faux libertarian slash you know, weird conservative kind of values it's really i mean it's way beyond you know conservative it's but it's kind of you know it's sort of uh shades of this libertarian kind of attitude where you just i gotta leave everybody alone and they'll just sort themselves out and get along and everything will be great if there's anything history shows us it's that is a delusional fantasy but hubbard did not want to be taxed all of this stems from the fact that l ron hubbard hated taxes and didn't pay them and didn't want to and didn't want anything to do with it because it was all his money. It's mine. It's all mine. Hubbard saw no reason whatsoever for taxes to exist of any kind. Guy was a fucking moron. We continue. So, um... And But this is how he thinks 
government officials and police think. You cannot handle a crime wave unless you consider every citizen a potential criminal and you have to have fingerprints of everyone to identify missing persons and bodies. This is coming from this police guy and everybody's just laughing at him. Zenu, meanwhile, was becoming hard-eyed. He clamorously struck the gong. He gestured urgently toward the curtains and the crier. And he's bringing out people now to do, to do rebuttals of this, right? And he brings out the, uh, the fat, pudgy, pig-like guy who represents the Galactic Interplanetary Bank. And uh, he comes out and talks about why, you know, credit records are important. And, um, and here's Rawls' counter-argument to this. Rawls says, these petitions show that personal income tax has caused wild inflation on every planet and has brought about economic stress. The government takes the money of individuals and companies before it can be invested or enter commerce. Wages and prices have had to be doubled, tripled, quadrupled to compensate for this loss of income. Inflation and increased public debt has followed. Um, As chairman of the Loyal Officers Economic Committee, I wish to remind you that banks were perfectly capable of handling their loans and affairs and prospered well before this enforced individual credit file system was instituted. Your business is with your customers and depends on your judgment, not upon some spiderweb espionage system that pries into the lives of every citizen's finances. Depends on your judgment, he says. We're supposed to manage 76 planets, trillions of lives, and their finances with somebody's good judgment. No rules, no regulations, no records, no record keeping. Yeah, fuck all that. That's all suppressive, oppressive, uh, what? Something. You see what I mean? Like Hubbard's personal nuttery on this enters into his thinking about how population should be run. And by the way, none of this is how the Sea Org is run. (laughs) So, (laughs) I mean, if you want to talk about personal dossiers of information being kept on each citizen, there is no system on this entire planet that is more efficient than Scientology's folder system, where they keep notes detailed records of every single one of the crimes you confess to them. All your sins, all your moral transgressions are confessed in sessions that are not confidential. They're, you're told they are, but it's all written down and put in a folder and put in a closet. And there are ethics files with reports kept on you that you do not have privy to and cannot see. That's the system Hubbard set up to run Scientology. And then he writes this. Just saying. So, we carry on. Uh, Yeah, then he goes on about even more reasons why it's all so awful. In fact, in light of what I just said, hear this. The flaw in all those enormous personal files being gathered is that they are obtained by newly active secret police. The credit and identity files of individuals are stuffed with false reports, lies that are never questioned. When the file of an individual has been so corrupted he can no longer obtain work, he is ruined. A person with a false file has no choice but to turn outlaw and criminal. As you well know, the criminal ranks, hideouts, and layers are swelling out of control and directly as a result of these measures. The criminal does not have to show an identity card to the person he robs or kills. Only decent citizens are being regulated. And as to inflation, this is just a, just a write-off here. As to inflation, other wiser methods and economies can be found to handle it. Xenu bad. Loyal officers, good. Trust us. We'll figure it all out for you. But we're going to rail against you, oppressive Lord Zenu, for trying to put some records in place. And meanwhile, Hubbard is running a spy network and record-keeping system that rivals the Nazis. 
I swear to you, I am not engaging in hyperbole when I say that. It's a little rich, isn't it? I just, I, I just can't. Ah, okay. History has shown that the way to handle threatened revolt is to remove utterly, fully, and completely all possible reasons for revolt at once. I want you to think about that one because it's just this little gem of nonsense right in the middle of this. History has shown that the way to handle threatened revolt is to remove utterly, fully, and completely all possible reasons for revolt at once. Laws of government that do not stem from the desires and wishes of the people cannot be enforced and must not exist. He already said that all these planets were governed through democratic measures. Democracy has as part of it the fact that minorities of people, not gender or race, I'm talking about just swaths of people that you can uh, classify any different way, but minorities are the people who don't succeed at the vote. The majority rules. So a minority of people are always going to be somewhat dissatisfied with what's going on. And lots and lots of minority groups spring from this on their, their, ba- on their causes to fight back against what they consider an oppressive majority of people who have voted various measures or laws into effect. That's what democracy means. Hubbard pretends that's not, that, that just doesn't exist. And that if there's a threatened revolt, well, you just capitulate and give them what, you just, you just stop anything that's causing any kind of revolt. What? If you try to govern that way, you are going to be lined up against a wall and shot in about three days. Because you'll give in to anybody for anything. That's not how leadership or government works. That's Hubbard's wet dream about personal freedom and getting to do whatever the hell he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. I, anyway, it's, and this is, this is, this attitude, the reason that I'm kind of like, err about this is because it's just reminding me of all the times he said this same kind of stupid shit in his lectures that Scientologists listen to all the time. And if you wonder why it is that ex-Scientologists will get on the MAGA train or get on the crazy train or the QAnon, why so many Scientologists are on the QAnon train, it's because this is how they're indoctrinated. They believe that government is bad, period. And then they think, you know, they sort of idealize democracy but don't understand it. It's all about me, 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 my rights over anybody else's and fuck society and fuck order and fuck law. I don't care about any of that. You're impose, imposing on my personal freedom, so therefore, bad government, bad, wrong. It's impossible to run a government without imposing on some people's rights some of the time. It's just a fact of life. I'm not saying that it's, the, the, that it's wonderful, but human beings aren't wonderful by nature. So order, laws, police, these things become necessary if you want to have the bigger picture being protected. I mean, this is civics, you know, this is, this is all one-on-one stuff. This is not Chris Shelton's opinions. This is all just basic stuff, right? This is how we, this is how we set up our societies. But Hubbard can't have any of that. He just rails and rails against it, and he thinks he's the champion of the people. The people would be in chaotic, it would be a chaotic disaster if you tried to run groups this way. And Hubbard himself didn't really believe any of this because he didn't run it that way. Look at what he did when he put his system of running things together. He created a Nazi spy network to manage his own people, not the outside world. You know, we've said many, many times that if you were going to, if you wondered what would Scientology look like if it took over the world or if it took over a country, what would it look like? It would look like North Korea. Almost exactly. 
that's what it would look like. And it would have the same level of impoverishment and and an inability to work and get anything done or show any personal initiative. It's all just for the leader. It's all just for Hubbard. As long as he's got everything he ever wants, he doesn't care about anybody else or anything else. And that is the legacy that he passed on to David Miscavige. And that's what David Miscavige has run with, with Scientology. That's, that's almost, you know, these, these are characteristics of destructive cult leaders, of human predators. Uh, just love soapboxing about this stuff. Sorry if I'm coming across a little heavy-handed, but it's just, my God, you know? Um, yeah. Okay, so moving right along here, there is... Uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna fly through this thing here and see if I can give you guys a few more gems out of this that I highlighted. Um, oh God! Okay, here we go. So, so here here is Zenu now is plotting Order sixty six. Right, he's plotting his three phases of how he's going to con- commit galactic genocide. And, you know, in the OT3 materials, it just says he did it. But there's no real details on how exactly he did it. So, you know, if you're a little curious, how did Hubbard imagine this was going to happen? It takes an awful lot of suspension of disbelief to buy into any of this. But here's how it goes, okay? Um, He writes... Okay, so here's Zenu and Chu working out the numbers. He promptly began to punch buttons on the table computer and view screen. It flared green and the green light shining upward glowed on their faces. Zenu muttered as he pushed buttons. About two billion for renegades. Another four billion to secretly rehire the secret police. Apprehension began to mount in Chu as he watched the dancing figures. The minimum amount, said Zenu, looking at Chu, is one trillion galactic credits. Shock made Chu twist a ring so deeply it cut him. In private funds, said Zenu, untraceable. Chu did not speak. He was incapable of it for a moment. With a long, expert finger, Zenu began to punch buttons again, and the figures again started to race across the computer, increasing the amount. No, said Chu. No, no, no. He gathered his wits and gradually took on a sly, calculating attitude. And my credit systems? You'll get them back, said Zenu. And the use of public treasury to improve my private holdings? Of course, said Zenu, because this is how bad guys talk to each other. With well-being slowly seeping through him, Chu said, a trillion galactic credits, untraceable funds and accounts. He got up and minced, minced to the floor, to the door. He looked back at Zenu and humming to himself, opened the door. Again, I'm just reading you Hubbard's writing here. It's, I, I, you know, you can kind of get how bad this is. But this is how they sit and calculate how to commit, you know, galactic genocide. Well, let me just figure out a couple figures here. Oh, yep, there we go. I think a trillion credits will do it to hire all those renegades. I can't tell you how many times the word renegade appears in here. I, I should have done a search. It's, it's endless. Hubbard loves that word renegade. He really goes on and on about this. Um, oh, that's a good point. I wonder if he did dictate this. I wonder. It, it doesn't, it, I'll, I'll tell you why I think he didn't, is because when Hubbard would dictate and it was taken down and put into book form, you have an awful lot of long run-on sentences that just go on for like a paragraph. And that's not the case with this. These, these sentences are pretty close together and pretty short. My guess on that. Um, okay, so they carry on with the uh, planning, right? And, uh, okay, so we'll have adequate funds, private and secret, and we're going to pull all this off, and nobody's going to see it coming. 
Zenu put down his glass, all business. And so we reoccupy the bases destroyed and abandoned after the Gray Invasion. We recruit every renegade we can lay our hands on, we train and equip, and on one certain day, a few months hence, we will. So they're getting all this money together so that in a couple months, they can recruit millions of renegades with trillions of galactic credits and reoccupy bases that were abandoned after the Gray Invasion. Okay, that's the big master plan here. Chu hastily got out a pad and pencil and eagerly started to write these orders down. Zenu knocked the pad up. He began to move back to the black table, leaving his drink behind him. No, no notes. This is totally secret. You will even have to develop your own codes and transmissions. You can trust only those on whom you have definite blackmail. He sat down in his chair. This will take very careful planning, a simultaneous strike coordinated on all planets. 76 planets, mind you. Under Xenu's finger, the green computer face lighted up. There will be no loyal officers left to object, and especially no galactic commander Rawl. Especially no Rawl. This pleased him, and he stabbed the buttons viciously. They wanted a revolt. We'll give them a revolt. Did you know, Chi, that all revolts start from the top? It's a historical fact. <laughs> oh, I love this stuff. I love this stuff. It's just kindergarten levels of planning. And, he, and, and, and within two months, I mean, this whole thing goes down in a couple months. This isn't a years-long operation. I, you just, I, you know, I mean, I guess you can make this shit up. Hubbard did. But anyway, I, um, I got a little, like, I had to go through pages and pages of this. Okay, so then we get back to Earth. And all this nasty stuff is going on, and the Lady Min has been taken hostage by by Xenu, and then uh, she escapes, and she's this actress and kind of ditzy sort of character, but somehow every single time she's confronted with an adversary, she manages to outmaneuver, outwit them physically, and kill them. Which I found fascinating, right? Hubbard's heroes and vil- and, and heroines never falter, never blink, never run into a challenge they can't deal with. They are super people. I mean, Hubbard himself doesn't seem to have any grasp of the hero's journey. There's never in any of his heroes a moment of self-reflection and doubt and challenge and, oh God, I fucked up here and having to learn from their mistakes. That doesn't happen in Hubbard's world because Hubbard never thinks that he has to do that. And, he, and every character, he, every hero he writes is just him. <sighs> so here's Rawl back on Earth now. Rawl's, got, Rawl's gone off to Earth thinking that he's uh, canceled out all of Xenu's nefarious plotting and plans. Income tax is canceled. Credit records are canceled. ID cards are canceled. The, the, the whole confederation is, is a joy in this. They are they're having um, joyous riots in the streets because of this, and it's all because of heroic Rawl stepping up, right? Rawl stood alone on the parade ground of galactic base Earth. The brisk wind. Now, remember what I read to you about the Cretaceous period earlier. I'm glad I did that because check this out. The brisk wind from the deep blue sea snapped and rustled in the flags. The parade ground was paved with white marble and surrounded by a gilded and ornate balustrade. In the far distance stood a volcano, (laughs) the wind pushing its plume of smoke into a horizontal banner. Near... N-E-R, the Black Mountain, which contained the barracks, vast hangars, and workshops, reared above the parade ground, its face honeycombed with hangar doors from which could spring a multitude of defense and attack ships, as well as transports. Um, So that's, that's, 
Hubbard's description of Earth 75 million years ago. Okay. Uh, and we have this, uh, all this military stuff, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> one by one, the sec- and, and here, apparently, the secret police on Earth are making a big show of leaving. And that, you know, we've all been shut down. We're leaving now, even though this is about a month later. And they've all been given these secret orders. And they're, you know, they're just hee, hee, hee. And they're taking off. And one by one, the secret police executives shook Rawl's hand. All in all, Rawl thought, they were a seedy lot for all their gold braid. They bore the mark of their profession, a bit craven, shifty-eyed, and debauched. <laughs> I mean, these descriptions, man. I just can't get enough of this stuff. Um, I don't know why it is that we're hearing people's thoughts, by the way, if this is supposed to be a treatment for a film. You know, again, Hubbard just reveals he has no idea what he's doing when he when he writes this stuff. You know, you're not into the inner life of the characters when you're writing screenplays and treatments. You are action. You show. You don't tell, right? You don't get into people's heads. Um, yes, we've pulled out uh, one of them. Okay, what is this now? Yes. Okay, so Raw, so all your clerks and investigators are leaving as well. And the guy says, yep, we pulled every one of them out of the 2,000 cities on Earth. He gestured toward the looming base. It's back to home planet and unemployment for all of us. These are the bad guys taken off, right? 2,000 cities populate Earth in the Cretaceous period. Okay. All right. Sure, Ron. Uh, Let us carry on here. Okay, what did I highlight here? So Lady Min is ridiculously escaping from from Xenu's planet and then finds herself uh, off on this other uh, asteroid. And then... um, Oh, yeah. And then they crash. Then they have to get away from there. And they crash on another planet. And uh, and they just kind of crash and show up at this guy's place who's some criminal. And apparently they've crash landed on a planet full of criminals who used to be gun runners. But ever since the laws were changed, they're out of business now. And they're very, very upset about that. And so, um, so this beautiful woman appears out of nowhere, crash lands, and this guy couldn't care less. The man just stared at the ceiling. Do I have a room? He laughed derisively. When those income tax laws were in effect, you couldn't get a room. 200 millionaires in this town to escape tax. Wine, women, money everywhere. Then they cancel the law. The millionaires all go back home. They don't need a tax haven anymore. He shook his head and took a gulp from the bottle. I I swear to God, Hubbard must have learned about economics in kindergarten and never moved on from there. It's it's really quite, quite bad. So we're at page, let's see, we're up to 54 now. Oh, yeah, okay. (laughs) This was just a bit of writing I had to highlight. Um, yeah, Lady Min is this heroine, right? She's the, she's the actress, beautiful woman who's uh, rushing to get to Rawl. And, um, and she is accompanied by her press agent, of all people, right? And, um, and she, uh, she does some clever thing and, and, uh, and is, and is uh, succeeding wonderfully. And, and this guy, App. AP, that's the guy's name, App. So he's ecstatic. Ecstatic, App reached Lady Men's side. He couldn't talk, was afraid to touch her. Not knowing what else to do, he whooped in delight and hugged the banister. Like I said, it's cartoonish. You know, these characters aren't people. They're, they're just... I don't know. They're not even like very good caricatures of people. They're just awful. 
Anyway, moving right along here, we're kind of looking more for the OT3 stuff. Okay, so how is it that over 76 planets, Xenu would recruit all these renegades? Where did they come from? How did he get them? Well, apparently they're hiding out in these hidden bases and planets all over the place, but Xenu knows exactly where they are and how to reach them all. No personal IDs, no credit records, no no passports, but somehow we know where all these guys are because the records from the last eight years gave them the dossiers on all the criminals. So now they know everything about them. In eight years, over 76 planets. Overcome with jubilation, Sna, <laughs> Sna, this is another character, S-N-A, Sna barreled forward to stand imposingly in the center of the dance floor. I got a special secret message from the minister of police. He's announcing this to all these criminals. We've been recruited. Every able-bodied man on this base has been made a special agent, and every ship we got has been put into Confederation service. Now, amongst the many silly questions I have right now in this, the evil galactic ruler, Xenu, is recruiting criminals all over the galaxy, all over the Galactic Confederation, by sending out orders to them that they are now special agents and their ships have been put into Confederation service. These are criminals. These are people who hide out from the government and the law and do nasty, bad, horrible things. So they get a message, and they're just going to join right up? And who's there to enforce this order if they don't want to? Try no one, because this is all super secret. The loyal officers in the actual army don't know anything about this. I, I, how does Hubbard imagine... This is supposed to go down. Well, outlaws leapt to their feet and surged forward, calling to friends and foe alike, exchanging heated opinions and speculations. And uh, a few people are not pleased by this news. A few, right? Most of the criminals get right on board right away. Oh, Xenu said to show up? Oh, hell yeah, I'm there. Okay. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. Uh, okay, so let's just carry on here. Okay, so here's a big part. Okay, so then we go into, um, I got a little bit of reading here to do because this is, again, how Xenu is establishing these. Uh, this is chapter 11. We get into this now. We're on page 58. Surrounded by huge trees, Xenu's secret base on home planet was dominated by a single domed building. Low and ominous military drums beat a deadly rhythm. What does a deadly rhythm sound like anyway? Rank upon rank of gray-green gray uniformed secret police, fully armed, lined the parade, parade ground in military formations. Over by the operations dome, an ill-dressed mob of renegades stood watching. An inspections party walked through the ranks, headed by Xenu and Chi. With them were tough-looking renegade guards, several high-ranking officers of the secret police, Zell, the ex-chief of secret police Earth, and Stai, the chief psychiatrist. Oh yeah, the psychs are all over this. Zenu curiously inspected the troops as he passed them by. He turned to the sweating Chi to bark a query. Are you sure this base is still secret and secure? Chi mopped his brow with a soaked handkerchief. Fool idea, this inspection. Too hot for it. Damn question anyway. Zenu already knew his orders on security had been carried out to the letter. We've shot anyone who comes close to it. Well, that won't raise any suspicion, will it? <laughs> I mean, what? Zenu nodded. Then we're almost ready? Indeed we are, Chi agreed, noting thankfully that Zenu was starting to head for the operations building. Stopping before the band of renegades, I told you, 
Zenu banged his cane to catch the regard of one of the two slouching chiefs of the renegades. And those men? The renegade chief smiled evilly, displaying a broken row of yellow teeth. Those are my finest renegades, sir. The finest and best criminals in the galaxy, fit for deviltry, and thousands more ready on every planet. Again, Zenu nodded and moved on. Halting abruptly, Zenu turned back to the renegade chief. Get them in white coveralls. They look like something from a sewer. Obeying Zenu's next signal to follow him, the chief sauntered along behind the rest of the party. He scowled at Zenu's retreating back, scowled at his deputy chief beside him. Steam beamed maniac. Must have a loose screw in his finicky head. Lily white coveralls. Nuts. I, I swear this is what it says. Ignoring the outbreak of ragged cheering among the renegade mob, Zenu led the way up the stairs and through the arched doors of the operations building. The actual operations office was located in the dome of the building. The sloped walls, painted with stars and planets, served as an operations map and were studded with abundant miniature spaceships and flags. Crouching below, a huge table was flanked on one side with three large rollers, on the other side by a rack stacked high with papers. Zenu entered the room, banging the door wide as he came and then limped across to the table. The two secret police clerks standing rigidly to attention were waved brusquely aside. Putting his cane down, Zenu picked up a hooked stick and turned to face his officers. Slap, slapping the hook in his palm, he regarded his officers for a moment. Black guards, the lot of them, but they had their uses. Oh, yes, they had their uses. The men returned Zenu's regard, alert and expectant, though the animosity was mutual. Finally, Zenu began his address. This is your last and final briefing. Listen carefully. He reached out with his stick and hooked it into the ring of the lowermost roller. This is a phase one of the galactic wide action. With a savage yank, he pulled out a chart from the roller that spread itself out flat on the table. And if all of this sounds a little anachronistic, um... This was written in the 70s, right? Hubbard claimed, and this is, what's, this is what I, one of the other things I just find hilarious about this. Hubbard claimed to have memories of a galactic confederation of 76 planets with spacefaring vehicles that could fly faster than the speed of light and could get around and zip around in the galaxy at a moment's notice that it would take a couple days to get, you know, over tens, hundreds of light years of distance. They could communicate instantly from one planet to another, no matter where it was. Instantly, they're having Zoom calls in this thing uh, over planet, you know, between planets. Yet, he never imagined the internet or computer networks Beyond the most simple Simon stuff that was coming around in the 70s that he was aware of, that was what he imagined computers would be at their height. And so he talks about things with paper and rollers and hooks as though this is all like really high-tech stuff, the really organized, heavy-duty, whoa, the head of the Galactic Confederation has got maps on rollers, woo. His lack of imagination is startling, especially when you compare it to his claims. You look at authors like Heinlein, Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, um, Philip K. Dick. Um, oh, who's the guy who did all the um, cyberpunk stuff? William, um, I'll get his last name. These are people who have imagination beyond their years. These are people who can imagine futures that actually have come to be. Hubbard imagines that the future is paper rollers and hooks. 
and claims at the same out of the, out of the same mouth that he remembers this civilization with faster than light travel. It's kind of funny, isn't it? It's just a little bit. I, I just I have to comment. So here he is pulling out and describing his master plan to his renegades, okay? The objective of phase one, Zenu continued, his voice losing all trace of its surface urbanity, is the slaughter of every loyal officer in the galaxy. Order 66, damn it, this is phase one. We're going to get rid of them pesky loyal officers. Those Jedi have interfered with our plans one too many times. Grim and silent, his men nodded. Reaching forward, Xenu engaged the second roller with his hooked stick. Phase two, the destruction of the main galactic defense base on every planet. Brutally, he yanked out the second chart so that it covered the first. He wrapped the second stack of papers and the detailed orders. With a nasty, irritating screech, the third chart was unfurled. Xenu struck the last stack of papers. Phase three, the removal of all minority and unwanted populations in the galaxy to the planet Earth and their extermination. So here we have a clear-cut statement that it's not everybody it's the minorities and the undesirables, as named by Zenu. A slow smile crossed his face. I think you will find this solves all problems of overpopulation, crime, and finance in the galaxy, as well as preventing our being deposed. Before Minister Chi issues the detailed orders, are there any comments? The momentary silence was broken by a sardonic renegade chief. You're the paymaster, he sneered, running a hand through his hair. Zenu glared the other down. And you, you're a prime bastard, indicating for Chi to take over. Zenu retrieved his cane and stalked from the room, favoring his bad leg. On the parade ground, the miscellaneous groups were breaking up. Regiments of secret police and bands of renegades marched purposefully toward assigned destinations. Drums quickening in pace, the military ensemble also took their leave. Soon, only the litter remained to bear the wind and the scattered guards' company. Chi was standing on the roof, silhouetted against the stars. His left hand held a radio transmitter. In his right, the dial of a stopwatch was illuminated by an electric lantern. In his mind, he reviewed the injunctions that Zenu had given him concerning phase one. Missed anything? Didn't seem that way, but still, he glanced down at the stopwatch. With maddening slowness, the second hand approached the appointed hour. Too late anyhow. He clicked the stem of the timepiece and spoke into the radio, phase one. And so it begins. <laughs> yeah, Thanos already tried this that right. That's right. Yeah, this is, uh, this is, this is just, uh, man. Now, here's where we get into a little bit of fun. Um, as oh this hasn't been fun enough i i actually i hope you guys are enjoying this cuz i i sure am this stuff is crazy um but here let's get into a little bit of uh specifics here right in terms of hubbard's writing and memory he he shows this panel this 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 panel with this jack plugs and brightly lit names of the galactic confederation member stars he lists out the stars of the various solar systems that are all part of the Galactic Confederation. And he names them by Earth names. Sirius, Canopus, Alpha Centauri, Vega, Capella, Arcturus, Rigel, uh, Procyon, Archonar, Beta Centauri, Altair. Okay, now there's four different ways to say this. I'm going to say it my preferred way. Beetlejuice. <laughs> I know it can be pronounced uh, different ways, like Betelgeuse and things like that. Acrux, Aldebaran, Pollux, Spica, Antares, Formalhot, Deneb, Regulus, and Sol, Earth, our sun. Those are the stars. 
that existed in the Galactic Confederation 75 million years ago around which planets, Hubbard says, and insists is true, planets orbited these stars with civilizations with billions of people on them. Well, okay. So just for grins, I just did a little random fact-checking. Uh, now, he also mentions during the text here, he lists all of those by name, but then also says later on, he mentions the Markab system, whatever, wherever the hell that is, and he mentions the Polaris system and how it gets cleaned out. Now, here's the thing. He mentions the Polaris system, but the Polaris as a star has only existed for 70 million years. So he's 5 million years early on the Polaris system. It didn't exist. Now, Polaris is currently the North Star here on Earth. We magnet, you know, straight up north. If you drew a line from South Pole to North Pole and kept going straight up, Polaris is what you hit as the North Star. But did you know that the North Star is a title that passes to different stars over time? Earth's axis of rotation wobbles over the course of about 26,000 years, the way a spinning top also wobbles on its spin. This causes the celestial pole to wander in a slow circle over the eons, sweeping past different stars. Sometimes there's no bright star near the celestial pole, as is the case in the southern hemisphere right now. About 14,000 years ago, the celestial pole pointed toward the bright star Vega, and as it sweeps out its slow circle, it will again point to Vega in about 12,000 years. That's the science. So he's saying here that uh, Polaris got cleared out. Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, or however you want to pronounce it, that star is only 10 million years old. Antares is 11 million years old, or Antares. Deneb is 10 million years old. Archinar is 37 million years old. And later on in the script, he actually calls it uh, Archnar. He, he changes the entire name. Sirius, the star Sirius, doesn't have any planets. We verified this now. Sirius B is the closest white dwarf to Earth. The leftover innards of a star like our sun, after it goes all red giant, blows off its outer layers and reveals its dense core. And I do mean dense. Sirius B has the mass of the sun, our sun, packed into a ball about the same size as Earth. It orbits the primary star, Sirius A, the brightest star in our nighttime sky, on a decently elliptical path that takes them, um, blah, blah, blah. They're about 8.8 .8 light years from Earth, among the closest stars to us in the universe. Because of the gravitational influence of the primary of Sirius A, um, which has twice the mass of the sun, no planet would be able to remain in orbit around the white dwarf farther than about 1.5 times the Earth-Sun distance. Anything farther out will get eventually tossed by the gravity of the primary. So again, there's no planets, there's no habitation there, and there never has been. Canopus does not have any planets. Capella has no planets. There are no known planets or... Um, Confirm substellar companions. Rigel doesn't have any planets that would support life as we know it. To be habitable, a planet would have to be billions of miles away from that star, Rigel. Rigel isn't as big as Betelgeuse, but it's much hotter. Um, okay, so that's just some random fact checking I did looking up those stars because I got a little curious about that. So Hubbard is naming things here, trying to sound impressive, trying to sound, I, I'm serious, Hubbard's trying to sound like he actually knows what he's talking about because he opened an astronomy book and looked at stars and said, oh, there they are. Those are the ones. And half of these stars didn't even exist 
And the other half didn't have, for the most part, have habitable planets. Only a handful of this list has potentially habitable planets orbiting them. We know this now. Such bullshit. Okay, moving on. Let's see what else we got here, if I can find some more highlights in going through this stuff. I started skipping whole sections, but, oh, here we go. Okay, so here we get to chapter 14. Um, and they're just counting in here. I mean, this is happening. This entire genocidal action of destroying, rounding up minority populations and all the people, the undesirables, uh, destroying these places, putting them in transports, taking them to Earth, and dumping them there. All of this happens in about three days in this story. Three or four days. If that, I think it's actually two, but it, I'll say three or four. Night was spreading her dark wings over the secret base on home planet. Shady figures milled around the gloomily lit interior of the operations room. Guards, the two renegade chiefs, and several bearded psychiatrists among them. I love the way that all the psychiatrists have to have beards. At the table was Chi, holding a felt pen. He was sweating profusely because Zenu was also there. Zenu, intent on the spreading phase two chart, listened with half an ear to Chi as his minister called out stars and planets in a quavering sing-song voice. All galactic bases Vegas system, chanted Chi, putting a cross mark on the chart. Yep, Vegas handled. He continued his litany. All bases Spica made a cross. All galactic bases Altair made another cross. Uh, galactic base Earth totally destroyed. Cheered by this news, Chi exchanged a look of satisfaction with Xenu and drew an exaggeratedly large cross on the chart. A travesty of a smile curving his mouth, he glanced back up at his boss. End phase two. Now all opposition is removed. What are your next orders? Thoroughly enjoying himself, Xenu stretched, stood up, and stretch some more. So this was what it felt like to be supreme ruler in full sweet fact. He searched for his cane, couldn't find it, and hobbled over to the center of the room anyway, assuming a splendorifically majestic pose. Conscious that all eyes were on him, he spoke, savoring each word to the fullest. Issue an all-galactic proclamation. Due to crime wave, martial law is established on all planets. He raised a pompous hand. Somehow his hand is pompous. Gentlemen, we begin phase three. We are regaining political control of all planets. Even at this moment, our planned agents will be seizing all government centers. But this is not enough. He made a chopping gesture. As you well know, minorities and people who might object, which is to say independent thinkers, protest a perfectly functioning police state, the ideal form of government. Furthermore, our planets are overpopulated. Phase three consists of rounding up such people on every planet transporting them to earth and exterminating them. A murmur of agreement spread through the listening group. One of the renegade chiefs, seeking an advantageous opening in these affairs, regarded Xenu through slitted eyes. If my men are to do this, they have to be within the law. Really? That's what the chief renegade says? Chi was as happy as he could ever get, especially when he was in such close proximity with Xenu. He butted in with a rush of words. All worked out. We're creating the Confederate Bureau of Investigation under the newly formed Justice Department. <laughs> He's got to get his dabs in on everybody in this thing. Every one of your renegades are, as of this moment, appointed government agent G-men. 
with full official powers. So saying, he grinned like a wolf, albeit with a trace of bulldog. The renegade chief replied with a wolfish grin of his own. He knew opportunity when he saw it. Zenu stamped his good foot for attention. Getting it, he continued speaking. The selection of these minorities is already determined. However, certain scientific judgment is required concerning others. For this reason, we have appointed you the top leaders of the psychiatric profession. The bearded men, the psychiatrists in the group leaned forward expectantly, hanging on Zenu's every word. To handle the ultimate fate of minorities and to decide who should be exterminated. Zenu paused theatrically, then added a magnanimity. A magnanimity. <laughs> I know you will do so in a fully scientific and dedicated manner. Gravely, seriously, the psychiatrist nodded in unison. Sty, top dog amongst this elite cream, the noble profession of psychiatry, nodded with particular emphasis, pleased with this arrangement. His long-sought lucky break at last. Zenu's surface urbanity slipped. They must, he screamed, never trouble us again. Checking himself, he got his mask back in place, continued in a more subdued pitch. The gathering from every planet shall begin. The extermination site is Earth. He drew himself up to his full, if inconsiderable, height. Gentlemen, I officially announce the beginning of phase three. As if by prearranged signal, several orderlies entered, bearing trays laden with bottle and glass. Someone had switched on a stereo, and soothing music filled the room. Drinks were passed around. Zenu raised his glass, and now a toast. And here, it switches straight over again. No transition. We go, and now a toast. And then we go to next paragraph. A family was seated at their midday meal. They stared in shock as a gun butt banged loudly three, tr- three times against their door, followed by a booted foot kicking it open. Two uniformed men entered on the run. Obeying the signaling blast fire, the family rose shakily. With rising terror, they were impelled out of the room. The youngest, a little girl, screamed and clutched her mother's skirts. A vicious blow on the head silenced her. You see this girl track all the way through to Earth until the bombs go off, and then you see the remains of her doll or something. Sobbing aloud, the mother picked up her child and was thrust onwards. A street lined with three-story houses was a pandemonium of panicking people. Secret policemen herded struggling men, women, and children out through exits and down into the street. A little to the side... A psychiatrist stood, looking up, a loud hailer in his hand. Protesting and bewildered blacks were being gathered from the shops and homes of their neighborhood by a group of bellowing secret police. A second group of gray-green uniformed men who were in the center of the street received the people passed to them. They held order with violent bashings and sweeps of their rifles. In a white middle-class suburb, a column of despairing yet striving individuals were being forced marched down an avenue. So, obviously, this I'm reading this to you because this is how Hubbard imagines you're going to round up the populations of 76 planets in a day or two and stick them all on transports and send them to Earth. It looks like this. The laugh of a young secret police officer could be heard above the din, the object of his amusement being an old woman, eyes shut tight and grasping a cross, being dragged along, legs trailing and bloody on the tarmac. A white-coated psychiatrist sat in front of the flashing boards of the Intergalactic Network Communications Control Tower. 
professionally unemotional. He was speaking into a mic. These are the determinations for the Proecyon planet populations. He consulted the list in his hand. All motion picture producers, all editors, writers, and newscasters, all blacks, members of the government employees union... Uh, And they go through and show scene by scene here, I guess, paragraph by paragraph, people being rounded up. Uh, On on Vega, the, the extermination list is religious leaders, athletes, musicians, teachers, salesmen. Uh, All the Ninth Terrestrial Army, all actors, all unemployed, all members of uh, dot, dot, dot. So this is how he he specifies who is getting rounded up, is apparently they have lists of all these people all set up, ready to go, and Xenu has ordered all of them to, you know, into the trains, right? And off they go. And uh, yeah, so he basically modeled it after Nazi Germany's roundup of the Jews, quite obviously here. And he imagines that all of this is going to go off with some kind of ruthless efficiency, even though he's using scumbags, criminals, and renegades to enact all of this. I mean, okay, cool. The last few undesirables were hunted down, knocked flat, and drugged up. And somehow they're getting um, uh, injections of something that's making them fall asleep or, or knocking them out. Hubbard refers to this as some alcohol glycol mixture or something that knocks them out and, uh, and puts them in. And so they can just throw them in these transports and ship them off to Earth. Yeah, basically all the people, that's right, Claire, <laughs> all the people who have wronged Hubbard are those he dislikes. That's right. I mean, this tells you more about Hubbard's psychology than it does anything else. You know, this is his fever dream. This is his Turner Diaries, if you will. Um, you know, this is his wet dream of, of, of a fantasy of how he thinks things have actually gone down. And now he positions himself as Rawl, as the hero, as the guy who's fighting back against all of this awfulness. And it's all just a fever dream he has. <laughs> But Scientologists have to imagine that this is reality, that this really happened exactly this way. That's what's so terrifying about this. So weird about it. Um, yeah, so there we go, the roundup. And um, all 75 planets clear, space born and heading for Earth right on time. Good, good. Proceed as ordered. And so we get to Earth and uh, the ships are simply landing and uh, dumping people off at the volcanoes. Um, He talks here about Mount Shasta. In fact, he specifies um, Vesuvius, Mount Shasta, and a couple other volcanoes. I did a little fact checking. Mount Shasta actually is only 593,000 years old. It's not even a million years old. Mount Shasta was not even a, a glimmer in the Earth's eye 75 million years ago. None of these volcanoes were. Vesuvius is 400,000 years old, somewhere between three and 400,000. I mean, none of this matches up with anything, right? None of this. It's all just complete nonsense. Yeah, Mount Etna, Mount Fuji. Um, they're, just li- they're just rolling people off. Uh, and here's the little girl clutching her doll, struggling to stay awake. And they're just driving them up the slopes of these volcanoes. And then they're dumping atomic bombs into the volcano on some kind of timer. Like this is, uh, the, I guess they have the technology to throw stuff into a volcano that's going to stay in you know in, in integrity and uh and that's what's happening here right yeah exactly hans i i think hans christian i think you nailed it here this is like a really really bad ee e. doc smith lensman story that's right that's exactly exactly what this is um 
And in fact, uh, John Atack says, uh, thinks that the, even the term Galactic Confederation was cribbed from E.E. E. Doc Smith and the Lensman series. So the soldiers are pushing these guys along and dumping them into these volcanoes and they blow up, right? They just blow them up. And there's nothing in here at all about any of the um, Phaeton stuff. That's completely omitted. They just blow everybody up and that's it. And then um, somehow after this entire devastation, it's kind of like one imagines Nero's Rome. You know, everybody's just kind of languishing around in Zenu's palace, enjoying the, uh, you know, the silence, I guess, and and enjoying their... Uh, you know, newfound power now that all those pesky loyal officers are no longer around to foil up the mix. And um, let me see if I highlighted anything more here from the story. There's one thing here. What do we got? Oh, yeah. So here is, um, oh, yeah. And then Zeno. Okay, so then Rawl and Lady Min and Mish run around the galaxy inciting the populations who still exist on these planets and telling them, just showing up in their spaceship and saying, hey guys, this Xenu guy just destroyed everything and we need to do something about it. Let's get together and let's do it. And somehow, planet by planet, takes everything back over. The renegades are destroyed, there's no military around of any kind. They just kind of walk in planet by planet, complete, almost completely, uh, you know, unchallenged, uh, and turn everything back around until they get back to home planet. And it all takes about 10 pages of story until they uh, get to Xenu and they capture him. And he just sat and sagged head in his hands um, and they took him to a solitary mountain that brooded over a barren plain. I thought you'd like to hear Hubbard's version of Xenu's fate. A cluster of blue and white trucks were parked around a tunnel entrance that led into the heart of the mountain. Nearby, a milling crowd of civilians and soldiers were scattered about. A military bland, band played funeralistic music slow in beat and low in pitch. Accompanied by his TV and radio broadcasting equipment, a newsman was keeping up a steady commentary. See, somehow the news is completely quiet on galactic genocide, but once Rawl comes along and frees everybody, the news is reporting on this, right? We are standing here on, a des on the, the desolate slopes of Mount Xenu, on planet Tawn, T-A-W-N. This is the mountain named for him in the days of unholy power when he planned his criminal course of destruction. It was designated, possibly with bitterness, as the final place of imprisonment. Officers of the court are completing dot, 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 Inside the mountain was a grotto carved out of the living stone. A blue overalled electrician was connecting up sheets of copper plating that lined the room. Alert guards stood about. Cables and wires lay in heaps on the copper sheathed floor. Several white coated doctors and their attendants worked busily around a semicircle of hospital style tables on which the prisoners strapped down were lying. Zenu was staring dully upwards as one doctor fastened tubes to his wrists and another fastened them to his ankles. The first doctor, having finished the wrists, began to put two prongs around Zenu's throat. Wetting his dry, cracked lips, Zenu looked up at the doctor, some terror showing in his glazed eyes. These devices keep one alive forever? Don't talk, snapped the doctor. A guard stepped forward. Don't talk to the prisoner. Despairing, Zenu rolled his eyes. How long is forever? No one answered. No one knew. 
Completing their task, the doctors began to pull out. Guards moved away from the tables. They filed out one by one, leaving only the electrician and one guard in company with the prisoners. Rapidly, the remaining two gave the tables and wirings a final check. The prisoners lay inert but awake. The banker and the psychiatrist stared wretchedly at the exit, small and more desirable than life, at the end of the long tunnel. Zell started to laugh hysterically. Chi looked around, vacant-eyed, and Zenu gazed blankly, torment torn at the ceiling. Satisfied all was in order, the electrician and guard also began to depart. Swinging the copper-grated door shut behind them, they walked the length of the tunnel. Reaching the final exit, the electrician switched the lights off and the guards banged the heavy steel door shut. Inside, the prisoners were bathed in darkness and the screaming began. The network buttonholed the electrician. How long, he asked, thrusting the mic forward, will the power last to continue their life support? Turning in some impatience, the electrician shrugged. About 74 million years, I think, possibly more, long enough. And that is the fate of Xenu. And it ends, Mount Xenu once more stood alone, no sign left of the tunnel, no sign of anything. A sullen breeze moaned monotonously over the plain, tumbling a few dried weeds before it. A faint scream sounded, perhaps a sudden gust of air, perhaps. Just the lonely wind. And that, my friends, is the end of Revolt in the Stars. <laughs> oh, dear. So I think, uh, I think we've covered this pretty well. <laughs> yes, he did break out of prison and named, uh, yeah, changed his name to George Santos. <laughs> oh, my God. So, um, yeah, so there you go, guys. Okay. Um, wow, this has been a thing, hasn't it? Wow, we started two and a half hours ago. My God, I did not think this was going to go that long. Um, yeah. So thanks for sticking it out with me, by the way, for those of you who have uh, been watching this thing from the get-go. I love doing these live streams. I love seeing your feedback. Um, it's, this is just nothing but fun, this one, right? Nothing real super serious here. But um, that was OT3. Yeah, that was that. Was, and, and go back and check out what I said at the beginning of the show, too, because I kind of laid out how it's different from OT3. But this is the narrative of OT3. There are additional Scientology elements in it. You know, like I said, check out the beginning of the show and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, Yeah, so there you go, guys. You can find this online, by the way, okay? You can download this yourself if you want. And like I said, there's a Wikipedia page on it. It is torturous, torturous reading. I ended up at a place where I just couldn't stop laughing. I just, every page was just more glee. It was just, I just kind of lost it a little bit a couple of times because it was, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a pretty big film guy and I'm a writer and I like legit, like like I really do. I've written stuff. And of course you guys have seen my nonfiction work. Um, You know, and when you, when you see someone who has made millions and millions of dollars writing this kind of drivel, you have to wonder about the world a little bit, you know? Anyway, so (laughs) on that happy note, um, thank you. Thank you very much, guys. You guys are awesome. 
I really appreciate your positive feedback on, on my work. I really, really do. And I will wrap up here by saying that if you are a lover of my show and my channel, please spread it around. Let people know what I'm doing here. I really want to grow my audience. I really want more people to see the value that I offer here and the advice and direction and help that is available in the years of content that I've put out. That's really what this is all about for me. And, um, and so, like I said, I want to, I want to thank you guys for your support. And if you do think that this channel is worth supporting, you know, sign up on Patreon, show me some love through PayPal or Venmo. Every little bit seriously helps, uh, keep the lights on, keep the show going here and keep me doing what I'm doing. And with that, Let's go ahead and wrap up. I'll see you guys uh, soon. I'll see you guys on Friday. And uh, and there we go. Uh, yes, please make that. Okay, good. Bye-bye.